Do you love Christmas? <laughs> Two of you love Christmas? Is that it? Anybody Christmas crazy? Do we have any Christmas crazies in the house? Now, I love Christmas decorations. I want my office and house decorated super early. This year I was a little late. Tree in my office didn't go up until the second week of August. And uh, people say, well, Pastor Rod, why don't you just leave it up year-round? Well, then it wouldn't be special. Now, I understand some of you think I'm Christmas crazy, but wait, when you hear and understand my logic, I think you'll understand why I start so early. Our schedule in December is absolutely overwhelming. Cindy and I have something almost every night, more than one thing most nights. It's exhausting. If I only celebrated Christmas in December, I wouldn't like it at all. I, I mean, I love you. I love spending time with you. But I'm not a big fan of Christmas parties. Uh, mostly because I really don't like Christmas food. I think Sam's Club has ruined Christmas parties. I've been to way too many parties with the same reheated appetizers. They're good, but only the first five or six times. After that, I can't bear to look at another Sam's pizza bite or a cute little sausage. I'm just done with that. I'm not a health nut, but I eat somewhat healthy. But I actually eat meals, and that doesn't really happen at Christmas parties. It's usually appetizers and desserts, and everyone wants me to try their amazing fudge. I love fudge. I just don't love fudge 22 nights in a row. There are a couple songs I like, but for the most part, I don't like Christmas music. Not for weeks on end. I mean, there are only so many ways to sing the same songs. I, I don't really enjoy singing about Christmas trees or little towns or flying reindeers or, or silver bells. Uh, Cindy records every Hallmark Christmas movie. <laughs> No exaggeration, literally every one, even though they're all exactly the same story. It's true. I watched, the other night I watched half, because they started like in October. I watched half of one with her, and halfway through she told me exactly what was going to happen. I said, have you seen this before? She said, no, but they're all the same. I said, well, why would you watch it? I don't get that. It seems like everybody has a favorite Christmas movie they watch as a family tradition. I don't have a favorite Christmas movie, probably because most of them I've never seen. I've never seen an Elf. I've never seen the movie about the lamp that's a lady's leg. Um, I, would, I don't want to watch movies about lamps. Uh, I don't even know the name of all the Christmas movies I've never seen. I, I'd rather watch football. You say, Pastor Rod, I thought you were Mr. Christmas, and your tree is always the first up, but now you're telling us you don't like Christmas parties, Christmas songs, Christmas foods, or Christmas movie. Which is it? Are you Mr. Christmas, or are you a secret Scrooge? Maybe I'm sending mixed messages, but let me explain. I love Christmas. I just don't always enjoy the trappings of Christmas. I love Christmas because I enjoy giving gifts to people. I, I save my money and buy Christmas gifts all year long for people I care about. I like to surprise people with things they never expected to get and, and to give them some things they're not even sure they want. I, I like giving. A few years ago, Cindy and I felt God speak to us to bless the people on the edges of our life. People we come in contact with, people who serve us or or we, we see them, but we can't take them for granted. And so we bless the girl who helps Cindy at the pharmacy. And we bless Cindy's favorite teller at the bank. And my favorite one was our trash men. Friday before Christmas, we prepared gifts for our trash guys. And we had the three big C's of Christmas. We had cookies, cards, and cash. Now, our guys usually come around 9 or 9.30, so I went outside, this is the Friday before Christmas, I put a lawn chair in the middle of the driveway, <laughs> sat down, and I waited for them. I was so excited. 9.30 came and went, no trash truck. 10 o'clock, still not there. 
11 o'clock, Cindy came out and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm sitting in the driveway looking like an idiot waiting on our trash guys to come. They finally showed up about 11.30. I walked to the truck and I said, where in the world have you been? <laughs> and they looked at me like I was crazy. And then I climbed up in the truck, which had to make them really nervous. <laughs> I explained what God had put on our hearts and gave them their gifts, and, and they were stunned. And that moment led to what is now my favorite part of the year. December 5th will be our third year to do Christmas for the entire sanitation department of North Little Rock. And uh, it's a lot of fun. The parking lot will be filled with trash trucks. Fellowship Hall will be filled with a bunch of guys and girls that we've grown to love. Uh, our trash truck driver, Eric, is my friend. If Eric's off work, he actually texts me to make sure everything went okay with my trash. <laughs> and so we leave drinks for our guys every week, and then every once in a while we leave gift cards for their lunch. A simple act of giving has led to wonderful friendships. I love Christmas because I love family Christmas. It's one of my favorite days of the year. If you've never been to family Christmas at First NLR, make sure to mark your calendar this year. It is Saturday, December 16, and Sunday, December 17. All four services are different. We tell the Christmas story, and we surprise people in our church family with special gifts. Some have great meaning. Others meet huge needs. It's a weekend filled with laughter and tears and special memories. I have friends all over the country and literally all over the world who look forward to watching Family Christmas. I love Christmas because I love Jesus. And when I walk past the tree in my office, it reminds me not of the trappings of Christmas, but the true wonder of Christmas, that God sent his son to earth as a baby. Jesus came not so we could have a holiday, but to live a perfect, sinless life and then die as a sacrifice for sin. When I think of Christmas, I think of the greatest gift of all, forgiveness that leads to eternal life. That's why I put my tree up early. I love Christmas because I love worship. When I think about Jesus, his sacrifice, and his gift to me, my natural response is worship. I'm grateful to him, and I, and I want to express it. I think the, the more you understand his gift and sacrifice, the more meaningful worship is. In fact, when it's an expression of worship, I love Christmas songs. That song we just sang a few minutes ago, Adore, I, I bet I've sung it 30 times in my office this week. I love that song. So I'm, I'm both. I'm a secret Scrooge because I don't get fired up about silly traditions. I'm Mr. Christmas because I love thinking about God's most precious gift. So if you're tired of all the commercialization and pressure that goes with Christmas, you're going to love this series. This series is not about lights or parties or fudge. Instead, we're going to slow down and take a look at the greatest gift the world ever received, Jesus. We're going to specifically study a well-known prophecy written by the prophet Isaiah approximately 700 years before Jesus' birth. Let me set the stage for his prophecy. 745 B.C., a new king was crowned in Assyria. Tiglath-Pileser III restored the country's prominence as a world power. The strength of Assyria put pressure on Syria, Israel, and Judah. Israel and Syria joined together to resist Assyria, and they tried to convince Judah to join them. Isaiah, the prophet, went to King Ahaz of Judah and told him that instead of joining the alliance, that he should trust God for deliverance. But instead of listening to God's man, Isaiah, and turning to God, Ahaz resisted the alliance, instead went to the enemy and asked Assyria for help. Isaiah warned Ahaz that the Assyrians would intentionally turn on Judah, and that because of their disobedience, the Lord would not rescue them. Instead, the country would suffer extensive loss and damage. The final verses of Isaiah chapter 8 describe the conditions that Isaiah pro prophesied would exist as a consequence of being conquered by Assyria. There would be great spiritual darkness. People would consult fortune tellers 
and cults instead of looking to God's word. The land would be cursed. Isaiah's prophecy came true. Ahaz was an evil king who sacrificed his own child to a pagan idol. He destroyed the temple of God, and his alliance with Assyria brought horrible results. The country was a moral and financial disaster. People were rejecting God's ways and living in spiritual darkness. They were stressed out. They were afraid of Assyria, but they were also afraid because they'd lost sight of God. In spite of all that, God was not finished with Judah. He still had good plans for his people. And Isaiah pointed to those plans in chapter 9 with this prophecy. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Nebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You've enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you've shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. This is an encouraging prophecy. Those walking in darkness will see a great light. Joy will replace sadness and despair. The enemy's power will be broken. Now, here's the part of the prophecy that might be familiar to you. For, or the reason for this, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. There was hope because a baby that was coming that was much more than an ordinary baby. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It was common in those days when a person became a king that they would choose a new name. And those names were titles meant to talk about the qualities and successes of the person. In just a couple months, my son, Pastor Tyler, and his wife, Emily, are having a baby girl. You're supposed to clap there. That's the, yeah, okay. And we keep coaching you week after week till you get that. Anytime I mention grandbaby, there should be just joyous applause and roars of approval. Tyler and Emily gave a lot of thought to her name, and they listened to, to some of your suggestions. They didn't listen to mine. Just tell you. Uh, I thought the name Rod would be a great name, whether a boy or a girl. I thought it was kind of universal. It could be a first name. It could be a middle name. I thought it was great. They were a bit narrow-minded in their approach. Anyway, they discussed and thought, and they made lists because they wanted to give their child a perfect name, E.B. Brook. I can't wait to meet E.B. Brook. But the Bible way to name her would be Evie, wonderful, beautiful, Smart, Olympic champion, grandfather loving, it's about time, Brooke Loy. (laughs) Now, I kind of like that. That's encouraging, isn't it? Some of you, I don't call you by your given name. I know your name. But I call you precious or beautiful or sunshine or friend. When I see you, I call you by a name I've chosen that describes you. That's what Isaiah was doing. His name, Jesus' name, will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, more recently, more recently, translations have combined the first two, Wonderful and Counselor, into one Wonderful Counselor. But I think it's more accurate to separate them. Wonderful and Counselor. 
Jesus is wonderful. Now, in, his, in Isaiah's time, the word wonderful meant much more than it does today. We've kind of weakened the meaning. I mean, ice cream is wonderful. The weather is wonderful. It's wonderful to see you. We even use wonderful in a sarcastic way. So someone says, yeah, we're so excited about Christmas, we're going to come spend a week at your house. And you say, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> and in that use, the word wonderful means great. That's exactly how I wanted to spend my vacation, waiting on you and your brats. I didn't, just, I didn't expect that reaction. I'm not pointing that at anyone. We're not having any company. I'm not talking about any particular brats. I was just talking. <laughs> but the biblical definition of wonderful wasn't trivial or sarcastic at all. In Isaiah's way of speaking, wonderful meant something different. Wonderful meant extraordinary. Exceeds all expectations. Marvelous. Miraculous. Beyond anything we've ever seen. That's who Jesus is. His name is wonderful. He's extraordinary and marvelous. He exceeds all expectations. He is wonderful. He is beyond anything or anyone. He is wonderful. Now, let me show you something I think is really interesting. The word used by Isaiah for wonderful is the same word used by God in Genesis 18. It's translated different, but same word. In Genesis 18, the setting is Sarah was 90 years old, well beyond the age to have a child. Abraham, her husband, was even older. And he became a dad at the age of 100 in response to God's promise. When God promised them a child, Sarah said, Will I really have a child now that I'm so old? And the Lord's response was the same word that Isaiah used for wonderful. And in that case, the word was translated differently. In that case, the word was translated, is there anything too hard for God? So you can read Jesus' name as, is there anything too marvelous, wonderful, and extraordinary for God? Is there anything too hard for God? Now, that's a name. Isaiah was saying, the Messiah will be a king full of wonder. The baby will be extraordinary and supernatural. From the very beginning, this baby is for us and far beyond us. He is wonderful. There is nothing too hard for God. And, and now, with that definition of the word, how much more does this song mean? His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. Master of everything, his name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages.
love and adore him his name is wonderful Jesus my Lord oh, just bow wonderful. Is there anything too hard for God? Now fast forward to Luke chapter 1, the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at the words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You've found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. Now look at verse 37. Read it with me. For nothing is impossible with God. There's that word again. Is there anything too hard for God? No. He's wonderful. Jesus' life on earth started as an impossibility. God's baby born to a virgin. From day one, Jesus redefined the word and the entire concept of impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. Now, intellectually, we know that. God can do anything, whatever, whenever. After all, he's God. But although we understand that intellectually, we struggle to believe it in many situations. Nothing is impossible with God. And you say, really? You haven't met my husband? You haven't met my ex-wife? She's impossible. Even God can't change his heart. You haven't seen my situation. I've tried everything. I've prayed every prayer I can think of. This one is impossible even for God. You don't know my kid. You don't know what God's put in my heart. You haven't heard my dream, what I feel called to accomplish. You haven't seen the doctor's report. Our human minds struggle to understand because a lot of things are impossible or seem impossible, but nothing is impossible with God. He is wonderful. There is nothing too hard for him. He is full of wonders. Listen to me. Look at me. Nothing is impossible with God. What you're facing right now, nothing is impossible with God. But Pastor Rod, you don't understand what's going on. You don't understand what they've told me. Nothing is impossible with God. You don't know how long I've dealt with this. You, you, don't, know, you don't know where I'm at. Nothing is impossible with God. The angel said to Mary, you're going to have God's baby. Nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, I don't remember what I ate before I went to bed, but this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it's not what she said. And said, her reply should be our reply. Powerful words from a teenage girl and a lesson for us. Look what Mary said. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. What's your typical response when God wants you to do the impossible or he wants to work through you to do the impossible? Well, I could never do that. God would never use me. That's impossible. I'll believe it when I see it. Mary's response was, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. God wants to use you in ways you've never imagined. He wants to use you to do things that are impossible for man but entirely possible for God. What will your response be? I want to be like Mary. I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me 
as you have said. Can you imagine a church where everyone gave that answer to the call of God? I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. How different would your life be if that was your standard answer to the Lord? How different would your finances be? How different would your family be? How different would your ministry be? How different would your relationships be if you simply said, Lord, I'm your servant. I will obey and trust you. May it be to me as you have said. Rome occupied the land of Israel, and God's people needed a miracle, a deliverer. All of Israel was waiting for the Messiah. Prophets spoke of that day. People prayed and waited. They had a promise, but no fulfillment. They had a word from God, but no action from God. And then one night, a holy and wonderful and special night we call Christmas, the miracle came. First person to hear the good news were not religious or political leaders. It wasn't the wealthy or the prestigious members of society. The miracle was announced to people who needed it most, the shepherds. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. It was a moment of holy wonder. God became a baby. Nothing is impossible with God. We try to force God to give us a miracle the way we want it. We know what we want, what we need, and how it should be done. The Jews wanted a warrior messiah. A mighty king who would fight and expel the Romans from their land. God could have done that. But if he had, although their stuff would have been saved, their souls would have been lost. So God himself came as a child, a baby, born in a major, whose name was Wonderful. Christmas is wonderful. It's extraordinary, spectacular, beyond us, and can only be done by God. And it seems like as sometimes we try to pull the wonder out of Christmas. Our sinful world doesn't want the extraordinary power of Jesus in the middle of the holiday. But Jesus keeps making himself known in wonderful, surprising, impossible ways. You can't have Christmas without Jesus. He's the center of it. He is wonderful. So as we approach this season, let me caution you. Celebrate wonderful Jesus instead of attacking the culture that's tried to remove him. That's a trap that makes you focus on our horrible world instead of our wonderful God. Don't be defensive about Jesus. Just share his story. Share the good news about Jesus. Tell of his wonderful, supernatural, extraordinary work in your life. Nothing is impossible with God.